Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Physical Chemistry 101. My name is Dr. Lars and this is going to be another in a lecture lecture. In order not to lose track of the many detail aspects of thermodynamics, I want to summarize the quintessence of chemical thermodynamics. We want to answer in a concise manner the central question of thermodynamics. Does a process, the makeup, actually run spontaneously? And if so, how far will it run? To answer this question, we will combine the first and the second law and define a new state variable, the Gibbs free energy G. The Gibbs free energy is a measure of instability. Thermodynamics looks at the world considering both energy and entropy. First, let's have a look at the world through the energy glasses. We describe systems and processes in terms of enthalpy. Enthalpy is a measure of the amount of energy contained in a system. Each system does not only have a mass, a volume, a temperature, and so on, but also an energy or enthalpy. The latter depends, for example, on the system's temperature, on the system's phase, on its chemical composition, and possibly also on its dilution. The surroundings also have an energy content, of course, we can imagine an enthalpy of the surroundings. If we consider a process, then we are dealing with enthalpy change. The enthalpy change from an initial state I to a final state F is denoted as delta H. Examples for processes are temperature changes, phase changes, chemical reactions, diluent or mixing processes. The change in enthalpy may be determined by measuring the isobaric heat. Furthermore, there are various formulas that can calculate the enthalpy of these processes. Usually, the surroundings do also change in enthalpy during a process. That is, we need to include delta H of these surroundings. The first law makes a statement about the energy changes that are possible in the universe. It is the concept of conservation of energy. The energy of the whole universe remains constant. For each process, the change in internal energy of the system plus the change in internal energy of the surroundings is zero. We switch from energy to entropy consideration. Each system does not only come with a certain amount of energy, namely the enthalpy, but also with a certain degree of disorder, a certain chaos. We call this property entropy S. The entropy depends on the system's temperature, depends on its phase, on its chemical composition, and very strongly on its dilution. Of course, the surroundings uh, do have a certain degree of disorder too, which can be summarized by the entropy of the surroundings. During a process, generally the entropy of the system changes. The entropy of the final state is different from the entropy of the initial state. The entropy of the system changes, for example, in changing temperature, in changing phase, in chemical reactions, or in mixing and dilution processes. Again, we must consider not only the system, but also the surroundings. We can measure the change in entropy by dividing reversible heat by temperature, the so-called reduced heat. In addition, there are more specific equations for calculating entropy change. The second law now states 
that the entropy of the universe can only increase. Entropy is thus not conserved as mass or energy or angular momentum. Entropy can be produced but not destroyed. For each and every process, the entropy change of the system plus the entropy change of the surroundings must be greater than or equal to zero. The limiting case equal to zero is called a reversible process. All other cases are irreversible. If you want to apply the first and second law in the universal form, both the system and the surroundings have to be considered. Now let's combine first and second law and seek a new state variable which contains only system properties and is a measure of whether or not a process can run. An important special case is the isothermal isobaric process. The path from the initial state to the final state takes place at constant pressure and temperature. We first distinguish strictly between system and surrounding parameters. They are here in different colors. The system temperature in an isothermal process is equal to the temperature of the surroundings. The enthalpy change of the system is equal to the negative of the enthalpy change of the surroundings and equal to the exchange T because we have an isobaric process. Thus we can substitute the entropy change of the surroundings by system parameters. Delta S surroundings is equal to negative delta H system over T system. The second law states that the total entropy of the universe can only increase. This law now can be completely expressed in system variables. We obtain an equation that is equivalent to the second law and tells us that processes can only take place at a particular combination of delta S, delta H and T. We convert this equation to delta H minus T times delta S must be less than or equal to zero. Now we rename the combination H minus T times S as Gibbs free energy G. Then we come to a very simple criterion as to if an isothermal isobaric process is possible. Delta G has to be less than or equal to zero. G, in fact, is a measure of instability. G can only decrease in a process, or best stay the same, can never increase. The change in Gibbs free energy, delta G, is a measure of the affinity or the drive of a process. A great advantage of the Gibbs free energy is that we may focus on the system and may disregard the surroundings. Now we have a measure of instability of a system. We know that G will depend on temperature, on the phase, on chemical composition and on dilution, as H and S do, the variables which make up G. We can also quantify these dependencies. We now need to focus only on Gibbs free energy to say whether a process can occur spontaneously or not. The change in Gibbs free energy, delta G, corresponds to the affinity or drive of a process. If delta G is negative, the process is possible. This is called hexagonic. If delta G is positive, the process is not possible. This is called anagonic. Delta G can be measured directly as reversible useful work, for example, in galvanic cells.
There are formulas that describe the dependence of G on temperature, pressure, the quantities of the substances involved in the system. If we now consider an arbitrary process, say the decomposition of dihydrogen tetroxide and 2O4, then we start by discussing the energetic aspect. The process is endothermic, goes energetically uphill, the enthalpy increases by 57.27 kJ per mole. Now we switch classes to consider the entropic aspect. How does chaos of the system change during the process? The process is endotropic, goes endotropically uphill. The entropy increases by 175.3 joules per Kelvin and mole. Finally, we consider Gibbs free energy. What about instability of the system, the reaction mixture during this process? So we consider G as a function of extent of reaction Xi and find that the pure products are less stable than the pure reactants. But between the pure reactants and the pure products, there's a state of minimal instability. This is the equilibrium of the process. And to this state, the system will voluntarily move. The gibbs helmholtz equation allows for the important variable delta G, the drive, to be calculated from the enthalpy change, delta H, and the entropy change. Of particular importance is the standard drive, delta G naught. The Gibbs free energy difference between the pure reactants and the pure products. We will determine the standard drive for the example reaction. We first calculate the standard enthalpy, 57 kJ per mole, the standard entropy, 175 joules per mole in Kelvin, and then calculate delta G naught at room temperature according to Gibbs Helmholtz. We end up with a free standard reaction enthalpy of 5 kJ per mole. Delta G naught is positive, the reaction as a whole is endergonic. It will never go to completion spontaneously. It can only go to the instability minimum, which corresponds to equilibrium. The standard drive therefore has an energetic component, delta H naught, and an entropic component, delta S naught. Moreover, the temperature plays a significant role on the side of the entropy. The numerical value of the equilibrium constant may be calculated from the standard drive. Delta G naught is equal to negative RT logarithm K. We set the appropriate values for the decomposition reaction of dihydrogen tetroxide. Log K is negative delta G naught over RT. The value of K is found to be 0 0.13. For every reaction, which is as a whole endergonic, the equilibrium constant is less than 1. The equilibrium lies on the left-hand side, on the side of the reactants. To determine the unit of the equilibrium constant, we have to formulate the law of mass action. In our example, the equilibrium constant has a unit bar. The gibbs helmholtz equation shows that the drive of a reaction and therefore its equilibrium constant, may be highly dependent on temperature. An exothermic reaction, which is endotropic, is always, at any temperature, exergonic, and thus may occur spontaneously. If the reaction is endothermic and exotropic, however, the reaction won't be spontaneous at any temperature. These reactions are always endergonic. In the case of an exothermic exotropic reaction, 
there's a ceiling temperature. Below this temperature, the equilibrium lies to the right. Above the ceiling temperature, the equilibrium lies to the left. In an endothermic, endotropic reaction, the situation is reversed. There's a floor temperature below which the equilibrium lies to the left and above which the reaction will be exabonic. Here are two examples. The decomposition of limestone to calcium oxide and carbon dioxide is a typical reaction with floor temperature. At low temperature, it's endergonic and equilibrium lies to the left. It is not until about 1200 kelvins that this reaction is exergonic. Lime slaking is a reaction with a ceiling temperature. At low temperatures, this reaction is exergonic. Above 1400 kelvins, it will be endergonic. The dependence of the equilibrium constant on temperature can be described quantitatively if we combine the gibbs helmholtz equation with the formula to calculate the equilibrium constant. We obtain the so-called Van Toff reaction isobar. The plot of the logarithm of the equilibrium constant against the reciprocal of temperature provides a straight line with a slope which is related to enthalpy change delta H. With exothermic reaction, the slope of Van Toff plot is positive. With endothermic reaction, the slope is negative. That is, with endothermic reactions, equilibrium shifts to the right in increasing temperature. The equilibrium of an exothermic reaction, on the other hand, will shift to the left as temperature rises. Using the slope of the Van Toff plot, reaction enthalpies may easily be calculated. If a system in equilibrium experiences a restraint, addition and removal of heat, PV work, or amount of substance, the system shifts to counteract the imposed change and a new equilibrium is established. The reaction 2N2O4 to NO2 is endothermic. With increasing temperature, the equilibrium will shift to the right. The reaction is also endochoric. With increasing pressure, the equilibrium will shift to the left. This is the principle of Le Chatelier and Brown, sometimes called the principle of least restraint. The restraint will be consumed. Here are some examples of the application of the principle of least restraint. In exothermic reactions, Increase in temperature decreases the equilibrium constant. Such a reaction should be performed at the lowest possible temperature. This applies to chemical processes, but also to physical processes. For example, the absorption of carbon dioxide in water. In endothermic processes, the situation is vice versa. They are thermodynamically favored at high temperatures, and this principle applies to both chemical and physical processes too. The yield of exochoric reactions is increased by high pressure. This principle is used in ammonia synthesis, in organic hydrogenation reactions, and in gas absorption. Endochoric processes provide higher yields at a low pressure. These processes could, for example, be performed in a vacuum or with the addition of inert gas. Both will reduce partial pressure. Examples are dehydrogenation reactions or desorption. Generally, the yield of an equilibrium process is increased by adding of reactants in excess or removing products from the reaction mixture. For example, esterification is favored if we use one reactant in excess or remove the water of reaction by distillation. 
The precipitation of calcium bicarbonate from the solution by removal of carbon dioxide from the reaction mixture is a further example of this principle. Endergonic processes do not run spontaneously. There are two possibilities to enforce such processes. One possibility is a coupling of an endergonic process to a highly exergonic process. Similar to heavy load pulling up light weight by a cable, the endergonic formation of glucose 6 phosphate can be facilitated by coupling with the exergonic decomposition of adenosine triphosphate. Another way to force an endergonic reaction is to supply Gibbs free energy in the form of useful work. The synthesis of glucose from carbon dioxide in water will never run spontaneously. Only when the free energy is provided by optical energy, the reaction proceeds as photosynthesis. A weight will never move upwards in the gravitational field of the Earth spontaneously. Supply of energy in form of heat does not change this situation. Only by supplying useful work, mechanical work to this process, it is possible to lift the weight. Similarly, it may be possible to enforce endergonic processes by appropriate supply of light or electrical energy. Let's summarize. We may calculate the drive of a reaction when we calculate Gibbs free energy delta G. Delta G can be calculated by Gibbs Helmholtz equation from the enthalpy change delta H and the entropy change delta F. With negative delta G, we have an hexagonic process that may run spontaneously. The equilibrium constant K can be calculated from the standard drive. Delta G not. Thanks for watching.